Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so far, Revo.js is just amazing. I'm really, really happy and really impressed because this is your first conference. Incredible. <laughs> um, so, as Diana said, my name is Mathieu Henry. I go online as P01. I am a software engineer at Microsoft. Um, I'm not exactly like your classic software engineer. I started uh, in the code club when I was about six, seven years old. Um, and we were just like learning how to program very simple things. And it was all about uh, making visual things like, to get feedback really quickly and learn uh, from, from that. And not get scared about what we were doing. Uh, and soon I was exposed to the demo scene, which is a movement about pushing the artistic and technical limits of any platform, basically. Uh, and I just blew my mind with demo scene movement. Uh, I kept following it, and I'm still an active member of it. And it just spiked my curiosity about like, how does this thing work? How can I do it? How can I actually uh, see something that I like and learn from it and turn it into my own thing? And so I'm really much a visual learner. I, I really love to get things on the screen to test and experiment and get going. Um, and two years ago also, uh, because I learned from the code club, uh, two years ago I created my own code club uh, at the school of my daughter. And now I'm teaching uh, kids from 7 to 11 years old how to program uh, using a very visual approach. Uh, so this is more or less how I went to tech. Um, at Microsoft, I work on what we call the mid-tier applications. Uh, these are a set of high-value components that you can see in Microsoft 365. Uh, Microsoft 365 is just the umbrella name for um, all the Microsoft and Office applications like Outlook, Office, OneDrive, Word, Excel, SharePoint, and so on, uh, on all platforms. The mid-guard applications are uh, the profile card, which we can see every time you see the photo or the name of someone in any of these applications. Uh, so you click or hover the name or picture, and you get this nice card with contextual information. Um, we also have a, uh, a photo picker uh, where you can, when you edit the contact, you can also change the picture of someone. Uh, we have a contact editor uh, where um, when you see someone, you can add that person as a contact, and then you can edit different informations. Um, another thing that we have is uh, the search box, uh, which we are trying to unify across, across all of Microsoft. Um, so that's... Uh, Sounds like an easy task, but it's quite challenging uh, to unify search across all Microsoft applications. Um, and all these applications, they are shipped in six different platforms. So all these applications, Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, which consume our applications, uh, the profile car, contact editor, photo picker, uh, the people picker also. Uh, is like when you add mention someone in a comment or in a, an, an email, you tap uh, the add symbol and start typing the name of someone, and then you get a combo box where you can actually find people and then add them. Uh, so this is a reusable component. Uh, so all these applications, they are targeting six platforms. They target Windows 32, Windows 10, Mac, iOS, Android, and the web starting from IE 11 and up. Uh, so we are quite a big team. We are 100, 150 uh, contributors to the code. Uh, we work on a monorepository with about that many packages, 100, 100 something, over 1 million line of code. About 70% of the code is actually shared across all platforms. Uh, we are writing tasks. So, and we have a pretty decent amount of users in the hundreds of millions of users daily. Um, so that gives us a fairly large code base, a fairly large surface area, and a fairly uh, big number of ways that we can break things. So today, I would like to share with you how we approach end-to-end -end testing, a world of web, mobile, and, net and desktop applications. I would like to share with you some learnings, some improvements that we did, and some of the work that we have ahead of us. Obviously, the Midgard applications did not start at that scale. Uh, it started much, much smaller as a technical bet. Uh, the team that I joined at Microsoft three years ago previously built uh, a profile card in one workload, in one website. Um, we saw that this profile card was pretty neat and people really enjoyed it. 
So we saw an opportunity to make uh, that into a coherent uh, user experience that could be shared across both Microsoft applications. So we made this bet to rebuild that, uh, that profile card as a reusable component. And for that, we used React uh, because it's really easy to onboard new developers and it has, if you don't do something too silly, you get good performance from your get-go, which is really nice. And so we started from this one website. We started to replace the profile card. And being in one website, targeting uh, only the web, made everything easy peasy. We, we somehow knew and controlled the whole uh, tech stack. We knew exactly how this website was working. And when we found a bug or a styling issue, we could just fix the bug or work around it so that we would not break the host application. So that was really cool. Uh, so we used React to build the components and TypeScript to get strong typing, uh, which was incredibly useful uh, because you don't get any, any bugs like, like API bugs because you, you get the type definitions, you get all your APIs are exposed. Everything is like directly visible in your ID. It's really convenient. Uh, for bigger pieces of logic, we use unit testing, of course, which is pretty classic. And as we were developing this new version of the component, and that we had to sign off every, every week or every so often to make sure that it worked in the website, in the workload, we were doing manual testing in Safari, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and i11. That was not really fun, but it, it got us there. I mean, we, despite the manual testing and the pain that it was, we were able to prove that we, we were capable of building a reusable component that could be used and shared across all Microsoft 365 applications. Uh, so this whole thing, or this whole bit, was validated, and everything grew from there. Uh, so we developed new components, and Midgard was born. Uh, we added uh, the contact editor, so that when you open this card, you could add someone as your contact, and then edit all the fields for that and the photo picker that uh, then you could update the picture or your own picture. Uh, and of course, the team grew. We got more packages, more users, more workloads. Uh, these three components were then contributing about 12 uh, workloads, 12 applications. So at that point, because we were not in one workload, we were in a dozen, we did not control the whole tech stack. Uh, so our testing matrix just exploded. Uh, it became really hard. I mean, it did not scale to manually test all of that. Uh, at that point, we were targeting web and Android and iOS. On the web, we used React, and on the mobile platforms, we used React Native. And we also used React Native on Windows and Mac. So we started to look at uh, test automations, and we will go through three uh, aspects of it. Uh, the end-to-end -end testing, the visual regression, and the component testing. And to end testing is about uh, really testing your whole application in, uh, in context. And visual regression is about catching uh, visual regression. Uh, component testing is about testing all your components in isolation. So for the end to end, -to -end testing, uh, of course, we wanted to test like, full scenarios, like as you really exercise and use the different components, the different mid application. But we also um, added some some measurements for performance and visual regression, uh, because this is the thing that really hit us the most. Uh, so first, we need an automation framework to run our tests. And each platform has its own way to, uh, to run an automated task. So this part, the end-to-end -end testing, is definitely platform-specific. Uh, for time reason, I will cover mostly web and, uh, and Windows. Uh, so uh, so we went uh, shopping at that time and implemented a some end-to-end -end test uh, with a different uh, automation framework. And we came up with this totem of automation framework. Um, on one side, we have a native platform, uh, Android, iOS, Mac, Windows, uh, and the different automation framework. Uh, the most common one is Appium, which supports iOS, Android, and Win32. But the Midgard team who was in charge of, uh, of developing uh, or targeting this native platform 
found that the Windows 32 uh, support and TypeScript support of Atom was not really great. So we moved to WinApp Driver, which supports all types of Windows executables, and really worked for them. They, they have strong typing for the language that they use. Uh, iOS and Android still use Appium. On the web, uh, you have the grandpa of, of all the test automation, Selenium, uh, which has been here forever, supports all the, all the browsers. It's, it's really like the cross-platform test automation runner. Uh, but the setup is very painful with Selenium, and the developer experience is a nightmare. Uh, writing tests is really painful, debugging tests is even more painful. You get really cryptic error messages and you don't know what is going wrong and how to debug it. And the documentation is not helping very much. Um, another one that we tried is WebDriver, which makes all of that better, but it's still a bit fiddly. Uh, so next we look at Cypress, uh, which you will hear, hear a lot more about tomorrow with Gleb. And Cypress is a new test automation or test runner built from the ground up uh, with a focus on the developer experience. I, I just wish I could use uh, Cypress, but we have to support i11, and Cypress only uh, works in uh, Chrome or Chromium browsers. So this is a no-go for us. Uh, all the components we write, all the software we write at Microsoft is used uh, by people like us, but also by companies, by governments, uh, by uh, education people, and everything has to work in i11 and up. And so we, we have very wide testing at this. So unfortunately, we can use Cypress. Then what we uh, tried was Puppeteer. Puppeteer is a high-level API on top of the Chrome uh, DevTools protocol, which is used to drive Chrome and allows you to do everything that you can do in the Chrome DevTools, but from code. So it has a very nice API. Uh, it has TypeScript, uh, TypeScript typing, which is very nice for us. Uh, so as you write your test, you get auto-completion about all the API, all the correct typing and everything, which is it's really what you want. Uh, and it's, it is, our uh, puppetry is developed by the Chrome uh, DevTools team, so it's, uh, it's really up to date. And they also implemented the Firefox version, and there is an unofficial uh, puppetry eye, uh, which I, I have to, uh, to fully validate. But uh, from what I've seen, it supports everything that we need for testing. So we went with puppetry on the web. Uh, the, uh, the idea to run the end to end to and to end test is to open an application with a build of your code that you want to test, the code to test all your scenarios, and request some screenshots from the test runner. Uh, so for that, uh, there are different ways. Uh, sorry. Uh, you can either uh, inject the test using your test runner. The test runner can inject the test in the application. Or your application, that is run by the test runner, can import like a normal module. It can dynamically import the test as a separate bundle. Um, so that's the two ways to get your test code in your test runner. Uh, you can do that using uh, the live site or live application or using a test application. And you can also do that using live data or using a mock data. Or your mock data can be like just JSON file or it can be a replay of the network traffic uh, that you run previously on the dev machine. So for native platforms, uh, on native platforms, they, they have it easy in a way. I really envy them. Uh, but the UI is typically very isolated. The components that they write are really isolated from the components of the application that they live in. Like if the application that they, they live in says that all buttons should not, should not be pink, it's only about the buttons of the application. It's not about the buttons of our components that are injected afterwards. Uh, so, and, and the same, if in our applications, which is pretty much a third party component in these applications, we say that all the buttons should have 10 pixel border, that would not affect the native application that uh, our third party component exists in, lives in. So, because of this isolation, the native apps can test in just test applications. They don't have to use uh, live application. And for them, it's also a lot easier to just import the uh, the test. We, it's easier to import the test than to dynamically inject them. So on native, we use, uh, we import the test, we use a test application, and because of the isolation, then they can use mock data. It's, it's really simple. Uh, and the, for that, they, 
typically use a replay of network traffic. On the web, we are a bit less lucky because our, uh, our testing surface is much bigger. Uh, so not only are we uh, the same code for the web targets 40 plus websites, but we also target multiple uh, browsers. And on the web, styles are global, characters is global, event handlers are global. So if a website decides uh, but if a website that consumes our component decides that suddenly all the links should have 40 pixels padding around, yeah, around the links, that will trickle down, that will cascade down to our components. So because of that, we have to test in the live applications. Uh, we, we have to get our test uh, into the live application. To get the test in the live application, it's as easy to inject them using the test runner or to import them, like to import a new test bundle. We, we use both strategies. It's, it's really as simple uh, to do one or the other. And because also the data that we surface in the different applications, say in Outlook versus in OneDrive, are different. In Outlook, we can easily surface your email, the email that you share with the person, and you're not surprised to see that. In SharePoint or OneDrive, technically we can do that, but, and legally also, uh, but this is not something you expect, so you don't surface the same data exactly, and we surface them in different order. So because of all these differences, we have to test against live data, uh, website and live data. Which is nice, because then we really get really broad testing surface, but that also exposes us to the reli reliability of uh, the whole stack. Uh, so if we test in Outlook, and for some reason Outlook goes down, then our test cannot run, and we have no idea what is going on. Or if just like one small part in the chain, in the, in the tech stack, goes down, uh, because the reliability of, say, getting an off token uh, to access an, an endpoint is 99.99%. We have a 0.01% chance of that our test will not get an off token and fail because of that. So it's, it's, it's a bit annoying to be exposed to that, but we have to live with that. So we, we, this is some work that we have to do to learn uh, from native platforms and try to isolate us or to shield us from that. So uh, another thing that you saw this morning in uh, the talk from Jennifer with Pali is that most of the testing frameworks, what they do is that uh, the, the, uh, you, you define your test. You say, okay, I want to go to this URL, click here and there, and then take a screenshot. Uh, this is great. But our, our code actually lives in 40 different websites. It lives in Outlook, in SharePoint, in OneDrive. And booting up or loading Outlook and reaching your inbox and everything takes maybe 30 seconds if you're on a slow connection. So if we were to do that, uh, then we, we would have some problems. Because you, you might say, like, OK, you, you created your own uh, and to end test framework and be like, really, really another one? Do we really need that? And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, we have to create our own test framework because all the testing frameworks that I have seen and I've been looking around quite a bit uh, only allows you to define a test that goes to one website, perform one action, take a screenshot or do some tests, and then close the browser. We cannot do that when just opening the website takes 30 seconds. We have thousands of tests. We, we cannot. We do not have that time luxury. Uh, so we have to create our own testing framework that opens a website with special build, passing some uh, feature flags that you want to test, and then inject the test code or import it, and then run as many scenarios that you, as you can, take all the screenshots that you can, and then close. Be done with that website. So we, we have no choice but to create our own testing framework. Uh, the typical test opens the, uh, the host application OneDrive, SharePoint, anything. Uh, import or uh, with all the config flag that we need. Import our test, and then uh, run all the different scenarios. So in the case of a profile card, you would open the profile card for different types of users or personas. Exercise all the panels, click through all of that. Uh, take some screenshots. It will also take some performance measurement. And also take... Uh, count of the number of style sheets and style rules that were added during the test. 
We do that because one nice incident that we had uh, where we was that when we burnt version of our CSS and GS uh, framework uh, that supports thinning, when we burnt to a major version, uh, the way that you do thinning changed a little bit. And we, we didn't pay attention to this. And suddenly, when we were rendering components, every time the component was rendered, all the style sheets for that component, all the style rules for that component, were added again. Uh, so eventually, we got in the range of 30, 40,000 style sheets, oh, style sheets yeah, in IE 11 in Outlook. And IE 11 was not too happy. And some customers uh, who happened to use IE 11 were not too happy either. Uh, so we got, an, yeah, we got an alert, and we had to roll back version very quick, and then to investigate and add all these monitors. Uh, so this is how uh, you get your test and how you can test all the scenarios and take your screenshots from the automation uh, framework. In our case, we cover hundreds, thousands of scenarios. We probably have some over coverage. We probably test some things too much. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the talk from Gleb tomorrow about some papers to see how we could work on this. And in the end, what we get is many screenshots, many, 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 many screenshots <laughs> in the orders of the thousand. Uh, so, That's a lot of screenshots. When you are developing, you don't want to get all these thousands of screenshots. Uh, so the trick is that if you build your test as packages that depend on the components that we test, then just following the dependency, dependency graph from Webpack will only run the test uh, for the components that you did change. Uh, then as you write your, your code, run the test automation, uh, or run it on CI, only the test for the components that did change in, in code will run, and all the dependencies will run. So you get much fewer tests. Uh, so now, let's talk about the second part of uh, the end-to-end -end testing, uh, which is regression testing. Uh, the visual uh, regression testing is platform agnostic, which is super nice. This is where we can actually uh, bring a lot and bring some value across platforms and across projects. Uh, because in the end, what we get from all our end-to-end -end tests in native or uh, the web is screenshot. It doesn't matter how they are produced. What we get is screenshot. Uh, so we can compare all these screenshots in JavaScript or in TypeScript. Uh, so the first thing that we used was Pixel Map, uh, Pixel Match by Mapbox, uh, which is a library which is used pretty much by all the visual regression testing owners. Uh, and that's incredible what we got out of the box. Uh, on the image, uh, on the right hand side uh, what you what you have is uh, the difference between two images between a uh, master screenshot and a changed screenshot and you see in red all the pixels that did change so that was a big big win uh, but I don't know if you can make sense of that no yeah, yeah, it will work. <laughs> and it was even worse because I, I am used to to look at these screenshots, and I cannot make sense of that. And every, every week, we had different people looking at these screenshots, and same, uh, we couldn't make uh, sense of that. So by showing only the difference between two screenshots, we lost all the context. So you could say, like, OK, in your, uh, in your test report, you could say, I'll display uh, the baseline or master screenshots and the candidate screenshots side by side. But these screenshots can be stored on different storages that request an app token, and then you don't have a look at the time of the report. So what we did is uh, that we wrote a screenshot diffing library that generates side-by-side -side screenshots, and that brings all the context. Uh, it works basically like a git diff, but at the pixel level. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So in the middle, you have the absolute diff, so what we saw before. Just in red, the pixels were changed. And on the right-hand side, you see a screenshot of your change with a ghost showing where the pixel change from the master. And on the left hand side, you have uh, the screenshot from the master with the pixel that change in your change uh, in red and green. Just like when you look at a pull request. And with that, you really contextualize the screenshots. And that makes, it's a very simple change, but it makes a huge difference because these screenshots are super easy to understand. 
and their action evolve. You, you don't, you just look at that and you understand more or less what happened. In this case, uh, in the middle, we see something that says, some pixel change around the text that says profile. But if that's all the information you have, you don't know what to do with that. If you look on the right and you see that your change shows the string LinkedIn and there's a ghost of something else. But something else is just that we change the string from LinkedIn profile to just LinkedIn. And that's it, it's okay. Uh, if we look again at the first change that I showed you, uh, we get to, now we get a clear picture of what happened. So in the middle, you get the gibberish with tons of red pixels that say that basically everything changed. If you look at the right hand side that shows your change uh, with the ghost showing what changed from the master, then it's, it's a bit more clear. Uh, what happened here is that we just aligned the typography of this panel to match the typography of LinkedIn. And that's it, nothing more. Uh, so, as we saw in the talk from Jennifer, uh, that she mentioned how to hide some elements, like third party components. In that case, we have to do the opposite. We are the third party component that is consumed by a website. So we have to do some normalization, and there's just a snippet of CSS that we inject in the test to basically hide everything that is not our component, uh, hide the caret, like the cursor in all the text inputs, because you don't want a screenshot that shows a cursor that is blinking, that will be some noise. We also collapse uh, all the animations and transitions so that all animation and transitions are instant for the test. Uh, and we also uh, make all the images with a brightness of zero. So we don't, like browsers know how to render images, we don't need to test that. We just make them black to see that here there was an image done. Uh, so as we use this uh, screenshot diffing library, we improved it, uh, we made it completely standalone. Uh, we added uh, this orange highlight in the middle uh, that shows where uh, where something changed, so it's easier, even if you get a really big, uh, really full size screenshot, you quickly get an, uh, a good look at where something changed. Uh, even if it's just like one pixel, you get this orange blob that says like, yeah, your, your one pixel change is there. We also uh, optimize it a lot, made it multi-threaded uh, multi by default. We generate a hash of the differences so that you can deduplicate your uh, differences across the files of the screenshot. So in the report, you don't have to show 500 times the same difference. If you just change one button to the same pixel to the left, you will receive it once. Uh, and the, because we highly optimize it and made it multi-process by default, uh, we can now uh, diff around 1,000 screenshots per minute. And by diff, I mean decoding the baseline and master images, do the diffing, and re-encode the image as PNG. You can do that 1,000 times per, per minute. And you can try our recipe for this wicked fast side by side screenshot diff uh, today. Just npm install screenshot diff. The package is available. The repository will be public in a few days. I, I got all the approvals, just need to, to go back to work and actually finish that process. Um, and I would love to hear your feedback uh, and help you consume this package to improve your uh, end to end testing. So we talked about. Uh, and uh, automation frameworks and to end testing on visual regression. Uh, one last point uh, that I would like to, uh, to talk about is component testing. Uh, that is to test components in isolation. And the, uh, the standard basically is storybook. Uh, you, you write uh, stories about your components and you can get a report and that renders all your components on the side. Uh, we, this is super, super powerful. We are uh, embracing uh, Storybook right now uh, because that way we can actually test all our components in isolation. Uh, we can also test responsiveness of our components because we can render them in different container sizes, which is beautiful. And, but there's a problem because, I mean, you test your component in isolation and we have seen that it's not the, it's not the ground truth. Like our components get affected by the style of the workload. So it's just one more tool in our toolbox. Uh, Storybook also uh, supports visual regression testing using Chromatic, but Chromatic uses something like Pixel Match uh, from Mapbox, which then is a little difficult to, to read and understand. Uh, 
So we, we hope that our screenshot diffing package will help visual regression tools to give more actionable feedback. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Mathieu Henry. You can find me online at Spezio1. And I hope it was helpful. And that I would really, 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 really appreciate if you could give it a shot uh, at this uh, screenshot diffing package. And hopefully, it can become uh, basically uh, a package that you can use and replace or use to replace your existing diff uh, diffing. And